Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine. Today I'm going to talk about the steaming hot mess that med Twitter can sometimes be. Now, I don't really want to talk about this. I've been avoiding it for years because, you know, it's going to make some people uncomfortable. And this channel has is not and has never been about social media drama. You know, Strong Medicine is about medical education, you know, EKGs and differential diagnoses and things like that. How, but, you know, understanding how to interact productively as members of a community has a place in education, too. And uh, it needs to be addressed, I think. You know, to be clear, I am not saying that all of med Twitter is awful. You know, most of it is great. It's just that when it gets bad, it can get really bad. And I believe that a lot of healthcare professionals contribute to the toxicity of med Twitter without even realizing it. Now, while I gave some serious thought to using specific examples of folks acting positively and not so positively on the platform, because it would be helpful to convey the points I'm trying to make, doing so violates part of the message at the same time. And it risks a med Twitter super user getting upset that I've called them out for unprofessional behavior, triggering brigading or flame war or other negative response. So instead, I'll be talking in generalizations um, however, I think anyone who has spent time interacting with and as part of Med Twitter will be very, uh, very capable of thinking of some tweets, specific users, or infamous interactions within the community that are relevant. Now, before getting into my issues and advice with Med Twitter, I, I do want to briefly define it, or at least attempt to, because I know that not all viewers here on YouTube necessarily use Twitter. Med Twitter is an informal virtual community of healthcare professionals who use the platform for things like uh, education and advocacy, outreach, uh, networking, and socializing. You know, there's no there's no boundary drawn around which users are or aren't part of it. And while we usually think about uh, only the users who are active members, you know, publicly posting and interacting, retweeting, commenting, etc., there are many others who are primarily lurkers. You know, who read what others have posted but don't generally post themselves. And I, I think these people are still part of the med Twitter community. Um, some users may occasionally interact with med Twitter, but spend most of their Twitter time on non-medical interests. And especially since uh, during the pandemic, there are many lay persons who now very actively engage with the community too. You know, so for all these reasons, it would be an impossible task to cite a specific number of people who belong to med Twitter, but it's certainly in the many thousands possibly even tens of thousands. This brings me to four factors that synergistically create the med Twitter environment, which can foster toxicity. First, there are a relatively small number of med Twitter super users who have an outsized influence on the dialogue, the zeitgeist, and the range of acceptable tone. Second, users create echo chambers by primarily or solely following those whose tweets don't challenge their core beliefs. Third, having the numbers of followers and retweets public contributes to clout chasing and what I think can be reasonably called performative advocacy. And fourth is tribalism, in which anyone who deviates from the predominant narrative within their echo chamber risks being ostracized by their tribe. This disincentivizes nuance and over time it drives people to adopt more and more extreme positions and more pure positions on issues. And it causes positions on seemingly disparate issues to become bundled together. So now what, what is the toxicity I'm talking about? You know, while virtue signaling and uh, humble bragging can certainly be overdone, those, I don't think those are toxic behaviors per se. What is toxic? Talking disrespectfully about patients, either individual patients or entire groups of patients, disrespecting entire professions, insulting other individuals on med Twitter, trying to cancel them or drive them off the platform entirely, you know, discounting value in opinions or perspectives that differ from one's own, gaslighting, harassment, pile-ons, and brigading. And what's the problem with these behaviors? For one thing, they discourage trainees from joining the community. You know, you don't need to look any further than the med school and residency subreddits to find how widespread negative opinions are of med Twitter among folks in that generation. But these behaviors, they also silence all kinds of people whose ideas some way fail to conform to the groupthink that's largely driven by the viral tweets of the super users. And these toxic behaviors, they're just cruel. So for physicians and nurses, empathy is our core trait or should be a core trait of our professions. 
to see some of the same folks humble brag about how they advocate for marginalized populations or how they can humanely treat patients with racist or homophobic attitudes. And then they turn around and harass and insult other doctors for having the audacity to have a different opinion on some specific, legitimately debatable topic. You know, it's just like, you know, like, like no self-awareness, you know, but these ad hominem attacks and cyber harassment, it causes very real emotional distress. And it is the antithesis of how we should be treating one another as colleagues and as human beings. I've been on Twitter for about eight years. I've learned a lot of actual medicine from the platform. I've been able to in meet and interact with some amazing people. And I've increased my own influence and reach of this YouTube channel, even if just a little bit. You know, Med Twitter has helped me to become more aware of a larger diversity and depth of social issues than I had been before. And it's been the source of some humor and purely social connections, particularly during the pandemic. And I so value all of that. But at the same time, it's also been the source of anxiety and frustration. You know, I've been personally harassed. I've seen many people harassed far worse than I have been. I've temporarily quit more than once. I zeroed out my list of the people I followed and started over from scratch to try to insulate myself from the toxicity. While I was previously an enthusiastic supporter of learners, you know, like such as my students, joining Med Twitter and becoming part of the conversation, even discussing it during a grand rounds once, you know, I, I'm kind of ambivalent now. You know, in, in its current state, I'm not sure that Med Twitter is a net good for every person who uses it. And I'm not even sure it's a net good for the world as a whole. It has an abundance of potential for good, but it also creates biases um, and creates animosity between groups. And seeing the super users racking up thousands of retweets with unprofessional conduct gives learners a skewed understanding of what is acceptable discourse and tone in their professional lives. And for laypersons viewing Med Twitter from the outside, I think it really reflects very poorly on our profession sometimes. This has been so frustrating to see because Med Twitter does not need to be like this. We can fix it. We can not only avoid contributing to, to the toxicity by adopting a non-toxic online presence ourselves, we can also actively combat the toxicity and make the platform more inclusive, more welcoming, and more compassionate. So for the rest of the video, I'm going to give you my advice. You know, it's based only on lessons that I've learned often the hard way on how to make your med Twitter experience as positive as possible and how to contribute to the positive experience of others. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting this is the one and only way that people must inter interact with and use med Twitter. You know, my opinion is not, you know, at the, pan is that, it's not the pinnacle of, of people on social media. Um, this is just, it's just one person's view. Um, you may or may not disagree, but I hope you'll just listen and keep an open mind. First, one of the most important principles is when criticism is indicated, criticize ideas and behaviors, not people. Even people you think are awful. Directed ad hominem attacks are never warranted. I've seen some super users justify ad hominem attacks by saying, a particular person's views are so dangerous and so beyond the pale that calling them nasty names is justified. But it's not. These aren't war criminals, you know, they are our fellow medical professionals. If an idea of theirs is obviously awful and dangerous, then it should be that much easier to call attention to it without needing to attack the person themselves. Don't punch down. What I mean by that is if you're a faculty member and you see a trainee posting something that you think is wrong, it's okay to reply with what you see as a correction. But remember, they are just learning. They're learning medicine and they're learning how to interact professionally. Learners make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Be a good role model and treat them with respect and kindness. Another form of punching down, which I find even sort of more problematic, is when a super user quote tweets a low follower account to their own tens of thousands of followers as a way of humiliating them, scoring points, and not so subtly encouraging brigading. This is a form of cyber harassment and it is profoundly unprofessional. You know, don't partake in it. Do not like or retweet harassment. Along the same line, avoid pile-ons. You know, if someone posts something which is a bad take and they've already had 100 replies telling them why they're wrong, Posting a 101st reply 
is only performative. It might signify to your tribe that you too are equally offended, but it doesn't actually further change the behavior or views of the original tweet's author. In fact, having too strong or overwhelmingly negative of a response to a person's belief can actually result in that individual adhering to it even more strongly. And I think we've seen plenty of examples of that during the pandemic. Don't ever celebrate being blocked by someone else. Whether or not you think the person or their views are awful, being blocked prevents any further dialogue from happening. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't block people yourself, but when someone else blocks you, it's either a symptom of general platform toxicity or it's a breakdown of communication between two individuals. Regardless, even when warranted and even when necessary for personal well being, it's still not something to celebrate from either person's perspective. Consider actively seeking out uh, users to follow with whom you sometimes disagree. By that, I don't mean deliberately subjecting yourself to people whose views you find despicable, where their tweets showing up on your feed will risk your psychological safety and just make you outraged and anxious all the time. Instead, I'm talking about folks who are respectful and professional while still holding views that you don't share. This has been another very prominent issue, particularly during COVID. Uh, I, I think all, anyone watching this video probably can, knows that there's these two camps clearly defined with walls of ever increasing height built around themselves. These echo chambers are not good. Even if you personally are objectively 100% correct about something, if everyone you interact with on Twitter, if they already agree with you, preaching to the choir in your feed serves no productive purpose. For most issues, not all, you know, but for most issues, there is a thoughtful, reasonable person on the other side who is able to have a respectful discussion about it. Conversely, consider not following or retweeting actively toxic users, irrespective of how popular on med Twitter they seem to be, and irrespective of whether or not you tend to agree with their underlying beliefs. You know, there are users who I have not only unfollowed, but have actively blocked, despite having very similar views on medicine because their online presence was so unprofessional. This is sometimes known as Hanlon's razor. Never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity, or slightly more charitably, that which can be adequately explained by ignorance. You know, if someone posts something that seems offensive or stupid, before jumping down their throats, consider, just at least consider, whether it's possible that a well-intentioned individual could hold that opinion through a lack of knowledge or perspective. And if so, Use the, opportunity, op, use the opportunity to educate them, not insult them. Related to that, if a respected user tweets something that seems uncharacteristically to miss the mark, instead of publicly calling them out, a single thoughtful direct message to the individual, it may accomplish more. You know, maybe they misspoke may, or mistyped. You know, maybe you misinterpreted. Maybe the other user just isn't aware of something. You, you don't need to turn every disagreement into a public spectacle. Be liberal with retweeting accounts or ideas that you have that you think have been underappreciated. And you know, too many of us, and I, I fall into this trap too sometimes. I, you know, we reserve our retweets for messages that have already been retweeted a thousand times by others. You know, especially after you've gained some degree of your own med Twitter uh, prominence, use it to lift up other newer or less well-known users. Promote ideas and perspectives that seem to have flown under the radar. When tweeting something original. Choose your wording carefully to safeguard against misinterpretation. You, know, you need to consider each individual tweet as if it were to become a standalone soundbite. Think about how it might read out of context. If one tweet on a controversial topic will need a second tweet for clarification or for a critical caveat, reword it or don't post. If it can be misconstrued, someone will misconstrue it. And last, when you see another person who has been the victim of harsh brigading, Twitter hum humiliation, or attempts at cancellation, even if you disagree with their original point that triggered the brigade, consider reaching out to them with a kind private message. Something as simple as, while I might not have agreed with your original tweet, the response you received was unwarranted. This happens to many of us, and I wish the community would do better. You know, I've sent such messages before, and they are always well received. I know that was a lot of individual points. Maybe you agreed with some, but not others. Maybe you, you disagreed with all of them. <laughs> you know, that's okay. You know, it's okay to disagree. 
as long as we check our outrage, you know, we stay respectful, and it may be cliche, but remember the human. Every tweet has a human being on the other end with not only emotions and feelings, but also with a knowledge base and lived experiences which are different from our own. We all have something to teach one another and we all have something to learn from one another. I think if we remember that and use that to guide our online interactions, we can collectively make MedTwitter a much more positive and welcoming community for everyone.